isn't quiet. Allergies. I'm now calling to order the May 13th, 2021 uh, meeting of the Jacksonville Water and Sewer Advisory Committee. Um, the first order of business is the adoption of today's agenda. Um, can I have a motion to? I make a motion to accept the agenda as presented. I second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? <coughs> Thank you. The next order of business is consideration of the minutes of the April 8th meeting, which I hope you all have had a chance to look over. Um, do we have any corrections to make to the minutes? All right. Um, can I have a motion to adopt, correct, or reject the minutes? I make a motion. <clears throat> and second? Second. And second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right. So I'm going to turn the meeting over to Wally Hansen now. Uh, we appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, we have several topics on your agenda. Two of those are uh, items that you actually brought up at your last meeting. Um, and with that, we have staff to present to you tonight, so you don't have to just hear from me, uh, which is a good thing. But first, I'd like to welcome our newest member, Ryan McCracken. Um, I've known Ryan for a while. He and I actually attend church together. Um, but Ryan is with Farm Bureau. Um, he does live in the city, kind of in the Henderson Drive area. <laughs> Um, and he's got a very lovely wife and, and two young kids. So, um, Ryan, we appreciate you joining us. So, and this is his first meeting. And then um, tonight you're going to hear from Derek. Derek actually attends all of our meetings. He, he's the one that does the heavy lifting and trying to put your agendas together, get all the information out to you, make sure, you know, you, he follows up with you if you're going to be here and that you have everything you need. Um, but... Uh, Derek is actually our, our public services coordinator, and there's a few contracts that he manages. And one of those are our um, water tank maintenance contracts and our cellular lease uh, contracts. And I think it was Mr. Nickel at our last meeting kind of asked a question related to our cellular leases. So um, Derek said that he would be happy to put something together and kind of bring that to you and go over... Um, the revenue that we receive uh, related to our cellular leases. And then you'll also hear from Amy tonight. She's our supervising chemist. Um, she's going to talk to you about two different things. Uh, one of those was the Blue Frog update that you requested. Um, and then she's going to go over some uh, water sampling um, information. I think I reported to you at a previous meeting that we had been able to reduce um, some of our sampling requirements, so Amy's going to talk about that. Um, and then we have Anthony, who's going to talk to you um, related to uh, sewer main inspection and collection system requirements. And if you'll notice on the uh, WASAC report that we send to you every month, um, you may have noticed that this month we've kind of changed it a little bit. It had been the same for a while. Um, but one of the things we did is we took our water and sewer system report and kind of changed that into a table for you because we thought that might be easier to follow. And we went, went ahead and, and pulled six, month to hit, six months of history and put that in there. And then we added a line. Um, if you look, it was the second to last line. That should be a new one for you um, under sewer main inspection. And Anthony's going to talk to you tonight about why that's important and kind of why we're tracking it. Um, it's something that we have been tracking, just not reporting to you, but it's such a large, um, it requires such a large amount of equipment and manpower, and it's required. Um, so we thought it would be something good to kind of talk to you and the public about, and then something good for you to follow each month. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Derek for the first item. Well, good evening, and uh, thank you for, for having me tonight and giving me this opportunity. Um, I, as Wally had mentioned, um, this is something I've been working on for a couple years now uh, that I've had my eye on, and it, it's one of the things that generates money and it doesn't come with, you know, a cost to us. So th this is uh, one of the ways that the city can generate some money to help, you know, offset some other costs. 
Uh, we last spoke about this uh, back in, I think it was 2019 think so. uh, was the last time uh, we did this. So not much has changed. Uh, some contracts have been renewed and we'll go through them uh, here in the next few slides. But as you know, we have seven elevated water tanks in the city. Uh, of those seven, four uh, are associated with cellular lease agreements. Uh, the li listed on the bottom, uh, Wilson Bay Tower, um, that is not a water tank, um, and we'll talk more about that later, but that is a, a proper uh, cell phone tower uh, that we do generate money on. But the four tanks that we do have, um, we do have cellular leases on, is our downtown tank, uh, Bryn Mawr, Commons, North and Northwoods. Recently, well, not, not so recently, uh, a couple years ago, uh, city management had established uh, some standards. Um, uh, prior to that, uh, there was a lot of negotiations between staff and uh, the different agencies and subcontractors that the different carriers uh, had enlisted to negotiate, you know, the best price for AT&T or the best price for Verizon. Uh, management decided that um, we're going to put our own rules out there um, so that we're going to um, get what we want um, and they're going to take it and they're going to leave it. Um, so the terms uh, and fees, by and large, have been standardized. Uh, what we've kind of come up with is um, seven-year uh, lease agreements um, and $1,000 per post per month uh, with a 3% uh, annual increase. Um, and those are pretty firm. Um, not every carrier that we have active right now um, is under that. Um, because recently, a lot of those contracts go back, you know, a quite a few years ago uh, before we established this. But moving forward, that's, that's kind of what we're aiming for. Eric, one quick question just yes. for me. Per post, what is post? Is that actual antennas or what, is, what does post mean? Okay, so a post, what, a, what a post means is actual space. Uh, so if you look on top of the tower here in this picture, uh, you can kind of see it, but right above the, the city logo, uh, you can see a couple of rings um, that go around the top of the, the tower. Um, and then spaced apart are spots where uh, you can attach um, these rectangular uh, antennas. Um, so when you see, it almost looks like a, like a one-door refrigerator, um, but that, it's the space for them to attach that. So that's what we're referring to as a post. Um, so that's what they're actually renting, uh, is that, that post space. And that's what we're, our, our fee is associated with. Typically, how many have you got on a tower? We have six on two towers, uh, three on one tower. Um, but we have the capability to put many more. I, I mean, we have plenty of space up there. Well, that was uh, my question, how features. much space per tower do you have? Nine, I think, right? I think it's nine it's, posts, if I remember right. Whether no, it's, it's or the, our commons tank, I, I believe, has up to 24 oh. posts. Is it each so upright that we're seeing in that ring? Is that a, what you're considering a post? To the commons, I think you have a, a better well, picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There, there mm -hmm. you can see the post. Yeah, that's what I meant by using those uprights, like, yeah. uh, like, yes, a, like a fence upright, post. Yes. That's what we would associate exactly. as a post. Okay. Thank you. Can one carrier rent a tower? There can be more than one on it. Yes. And do we provide the electricity, or how does, where does that come from? That's a, a good question that we yeah. do. It's through us. We do provide the electricity. But some of them have their own generators. They, they have their own generators, and it's, it's, it's pretty minimal. Right. Okay. Yep. So our first uh, water tank uh, downtown is Sprint. Uh, they've been there for, for quite a while. Uh, right now, the, we are receiving uh, $3,800 a month. Um, they have uh, three posts uh, that, that are leased to them uh, at that location. 
and that contract expires in uh, 2024. Um, even and they have a 3% annual increase. So in the next FY, uh, that monthly cost will go up just 3%. So at this location, one carrier in Sprint. In our, at our Bryn Mawr location, we have two separate carriers, T-Mobile and AT&T. Um, AT&T uh, recently uh, renewed their uh, lease agreement at that location uh, with our, our new uh, rates at $1,000 per post with a 3% increase. Um, right now they're paying $6,365 uh, a month uh, for, for that space there. And T-Mobile, uh, who has been on that tank, they were the first ones on that tank, um, they're paying 3128 a month with a 3.5% annual increase. Uh, but you'll look at their uh, that expiration date on that agreement is uh, 2031. Um, so as you know, that, that one's been there for a while. And what, when they negotiate with us, what they typically like to do um, is you know, get that space for as uh, large amount of time as they can, you know, in some cases, 25 years. Um, so we've definitely gotten away from that. But this is one of the, uh, the original carriers that we had at our Bryn Mawr tank. The Commons tank, um, this tank uh, actually has the most space uh, to support additional carriers. As previously mentioned, right now we have AT&T and Verizon. Um, those are both fairly new. Uh, Verizon is new. Uh, AT&T, uh, they're on a renewal uh, at that location. Uh, and the revenue from AT&T is over 6000 and Verizon. Uh, they're only uh, occupying two posts, uh, and that's why that number there is smaller at 2,121. And then our Northwoods tank, uh, we have one carrier there, uh, AT&T. They've been there for a while as well. They have six posts at that location, um, and that's the most recent uh, renewal that uh, council approved, uh, 6000 a month, um, and that one expires in uh, 2027. So <clears throat> at the, down at the public services complex, uh, there's a, a large uh, cellular tower, um, American Tower. This tower uh, we don't own, uh, but we own the property. Uh, so what they're paying us for uh, is to rent the, the land, uh, the space that it sits on. Um, so as far as carriers on top of that tower that utilize it, um, we, we don't really have a dog in that fight. Um, we don't have any contact with them. Um, the agreement was just for us to, to lease the land. Um, and we're currently we're getting $2,309 a month uh, for that piece of property with a 4% increase expiring in 2034. And then this is our revenues uh, for uh, last year, this year, and what we expect next year. And as you can see uh, with each fiscal year, it, it uh, with those annual increases, they, they slowly tick up. And Derek, I believe at a prior meeting you mentioned that that covers the maintenance of the water tanks? It does. Uh, so with uh, the revenue generated currently with our cellular lease agreements, uh, it does cover the cost, the entire cost of what we have for our asset management program. Okay. Now the money collected from this, does it go straight to the water and sewer or is it just this city budget? Yes, sir, this is, this is water and sewer money. So water and sewer gets all of this? Yes. Okay. So it does offset, offset rates that rate payers would pay. Um, and like Dr. Rashash and Derek pointed out, it's, you know, it more than covers the cost that we have annually in asset maintenance for our water tanks. And that's all of our water tanks, including some that, are not elevated tanks like Gum Branch Central, which is a below ground tank, um, which we just did recent maintenance on. So, um, you know, this is a, a very beneficial program to the water and sewer fund. 
will some of this fund be able to be directed towards the upgrades of the tanks and their potential elevation? Because you talked about potentially elevating one or two of the tanks. We still have, to be determined, we still have two tanks, I believe. We have two elevated tanks and then the storage tank at the plant that are not on asset management yet. Okay. Um, so if you remember, our asset management program is basically a 10-year contract, and the contractor um, paints the tank the first year, maintains it throughout the life, and then, like I said, it's a 10-year contract, paints it the, the final year of the contract. And then our cost dramatically decreases, and they continue annual maintenance until we get to that 10th year, year again, and then we'll have to look at renewals. Mm -hmm. um, we have two elevated tanks that we still need to get onto that program. And we've been staggering getting those into the program uh, so that we don't have this large upfront contracted cost for all of our tanks. So as, um, as some of those you know, tanks fall into that 10th year where the price drops, or um, some of them, you know, Gun Branch Central, for example, had a higher first three years, and then it kind of drops off a little bit because it's a, you know, it's a concrete in-ground tank, so it's a little bit different. Um, so as those, you know, as those decline is when we add another. So what we're going for is trying to level our expenses so we don't have you know, what, what the city used to do, um, and Jill would remember this probably because she was involved, we would wait till the very end and then paint a tank when we absolutely had to. And then it was this astronomical cost to actually paint. You know, if I remember right, it was, you know, I, I don't remember the, the exact cost, but it was an astronomical cost. You had to tank it completely out of service. Mm -hmm. um, on some of them, we had to do lead abatement, you know, because lead had been used or, or whatever in previous cycles. So what we've tried to do is actually level that cost so you don't have these huge spikes uh, every few years because, you know, as we have so many tanks, you know, the, the paint's only lasting 10 to, to 12 years. And all of a sudden, you have this large spike. In addition, as part of the asset maintenance, um, Derek actually has a contact. And any time a cell carrier needs to do work or do something or modify a corral or anything like that, that our asset management folks actually handle that coordination, <laughs> that infill coordination, to make sure they don't damage our tank or if they you know, that they secure wires properly, all of those kind of things. They climb the tank, do the inspection, and that's all under our asset management program. <coughs> so we don't have to have, you know, certified safety <coughs> devices and, and people to climb the tanks. So it's a, it's been a very good beneficial program, especially being that it offsets it. What we'll have to see is as we bring those others in, is there enough revenue left over to try to fund something like raising a tank like we talked about. Okay. So I, we, we just don't know if, you know, as those increases continue and we're bringing additional tanks on, I don't know that there's enough there to completely offset the cost of that project. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to first be talking about our water sampling, our drinking water sampling. And then after that, it'll be the blue frog updates that you requested. Um, so for what is required for us for water compliance through the state and the EPA, they require that we sample for different testing, which we'll get into more specifics in a little bit. Um, but initially, we're going to discuss the entry points to the system, which those are, are essentially our finished water entering the system from the nano plant, gum branch, well six, and well seven. 
And then after, we're going to follow up with sampling from our distribution system throughout the city. So like I said before, our entry point sampling is Gum Branch, Well 6, Well 7, and the nanofiltration plant. Um, that map there, I think, shows them very, very small, and you probably have to go up very close to see the actual entry point triangles. Um, but what's required of us by the state and the EPA is to sample for inorganics, secondaries, nitrate, radionuclides, SOCs, and VOCs. Each of them kind of runs on a different compliance period cycle. So some have to be sampled in the course of one year. Some have to be sampled every three years. Um, it changes like that, and we will get into more of that. Excuse me, Amy. Yes. Uh, some of our viewing audience might not know what these terms mean. Could you give an example for each? Especially for secondaries. Okay. Um, secondaries is actually one of the more common ones. Um, secondaries include things that do not have a maximum contaminant level. So while they are something people might be concerned with, it's more the aesthetic values. So they fall under um, hardness, pH, um, different factors like that that don't really, it adds to odor, taste, um, color, different effects of the water. So, so that one's actually one that we have to do but it's not actually, there is no limit for it. There's an ideal range in some cases, but there's no actual limit for it. Um, inorganics, I'm drawing a blank at the moment. <laughs> um, inorganics includes like your metals, um, mostly different metals, um, and like iron, manganese, lead, copper, they'd fall under your inorganics. Um, Nitrate sampling is usually it's nitrate and nitrite, a form of nitrogen. Um, it is a, it's important in water because there's a lot of runoff that comes from nitrogen and phosphorus and from um, different fertilizers and things like that. And there's some concern with nitrate levels and nitrite levels in, I believe it's more for, um, it affects children more than it affects adults, but it's still a general concern. Um, radionuclides, that's when they've added um, in the last 15, 20 years as more of a concern. Um, Initially, you sample for an overall scan of a few different versions, but it does specialize into uranium, radon, gross alpha. Um, your synthetic organic chemicals, well, let me start with the volatile organic chemicals. Your volatile organic chemicals are chemicals that can easily disperse in the environment. While your synthetic ones are volatile and organic chemicals that are synthetic and man-made. So your synthetic ones will include um, different pesticides, herbicides, things that are not natural that man created. Um, and then you have your volatiles, which is, can be naturally exist. So. For first up, um, the only one that's required annually is our nitrate sampling. Um, we have already completed it for all of our entry points for 2021. And I believe 2020 is what's reflected on your, um, the CCR, the consumer competence report that you would have received for 2020. And I believe the link to that is on our website and was also in our bill insert. Um, but everything for that is coming back as less than detected at this point. And so we are not required to sample that again until 2022. Amy, thank you for mentioning the CCR. For people who only get their bill electronically, uh, would they have been notified about that link? included. 
It should have the, been. The, it should have been an attachment. Okay, so I didn't But then, then not knowing a timetable of, okay, did it come out in March? Did it come out in April? Um, it would have been. I believe it was in our April. Yes, I think so. Yeah, it was in the last bill I got, I think the last bill I got. Okay, so April. people who didn't notice that got it online can go back to look at the email message they got yes. and see what their or consumer the confidence website. or, or on the website. On the website, I think it's a water quality report is the name of it on the website, and there's a link to it there also. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So most of the other chemicals that we're looking at fall into a three-year sampling period. So the one we're currently in is from 2020 to 2022. Um, and we have completed sampling for the secondaries or inorganics, the VOCs. Um, the synthetics require a two samples in one calendar year, but it has to be during different quarters. So we have sampled one for each of the entry points so far, but in the third or fourth quarter is when we're going to have to sample the other ones. And then we should be okay until it re-ups in 2023. Radionuclide sampling falls under, there's a different range. Nine year period is the primary um, range that we are given for the different radionuclides. And that includes a sum total of a few of them. While some of the other ones, I believe it's well six, for example, while it was not over the MCL range, it did at one point sample with some present. So that's on a six year sampling period, for example, now. And it also gets split up and tested for uranium and radon specifically. Um, so that sampling period, it rotates some, but for the most part, each entry point now, we are complete with until 2026. Now we're gonna talk about our distribution system. Excuse which, me, Amy. Uh, yes. Wally, is it good to assume that since we're not getting surface water from a river that the sampling has shown that the Black Creek and the other aquifer are f very, very safe, or are they just? I think it's safe to say that the, we pull our water from, you know, deep aquifers. I mean, both are, are fairly deep. The Castle Haynes, I think we're, our wells are somewhere in the 210 to 260 feet range. And then in the, for the Black Creek, we're in the six to 700 foot range, I believe. So, you know, that's much safer than surface water. Um, it's probably also a lot so, more consistent than yeah, surface water. <laughs> absolutely. Surface water and you're not, you know, with surface over. water, it, you know, everybody's familiar with the Gen X challenge that, you know, um, Wilmington and New Hanover and some of those have faced with the Cape Fear because there was a plant upstream discharging, you know, waste water, not sewer, but water used in their process into the Cape Fear River, and they're using it downstream for, you know, water. Um, it's treated, but those are, you know, those are obviously concerns that we don't have as, you know, much concern over when you have deeper aquifers. But that doesn't mean that you can't, you shouldn't be careful because you could have, you know, cross connection and, you know, chlorides are always of a concern because if you over pump an aquifer, you could, you know, pull salt water in from either deeper aquifers or, you know, because we are a coastal community. Thank you. So our distribution system essentially scans all of the service lines um, that we have within the city. Um, for distributions, we sample for total coliform. Um, there is an asbestos sample because we do have asbestos concrete lines. Um, I believe it's very minimal, like 4% of our total lines within the city, um, but they still are there. Um, and then disinfection byproducts, which is, we will get into that a little bit more in a second. And then our lead and copper samples. 
For total coliform, um, we have a plan that we are required to have that samples 50 samples per month throughout the city. Um, it rotates. We cannot sample the same location in one month, but it can be sampled other months repeated. Um, we have a plan that rotates where it's basically every three months we will resample the same sites. Um, so this plan, it's split up throughout the city, um, and the map there kind of shows some of our distribution system area, and we try to get it in all areas of the city. So if new communities come online, things like that, we try to add more houses to it or different houses to be able to reflect that so they're not all just clustered in one little area. Um, originally, a long time ago, <laughs> it seems like it was a lot of people who um, were may have worked for the city or were affiliated in different areas ended up on the list, and um, it's kind of gone on from there. I know now most of the operators or lab techs will ask people if they want to be added to the list because they do have some people that you know, the house was sold or mm -hmm. it's a rental and they no longer want to be on it or have no idea what we're doing there. So there is usually every year or two we will end up with a list where we have to rotate five to ten of them off of it because people have requested not to be on it. Um, so we try to, I think for the most part, we last updated it in 2019, but I have heard there's a couple now that one is completely shut off, and um, at that point, we usually pick an alternate, which might be one from another month, or we have a list of a couple alternates that we can use to meet the 50. Um, and, and to add to that, I think when we do, you know, service or complaint calls periodically, a common one is I turn on my sink and it stinks. There's a lot of odor, and most of the time, it's actually coming from the garbage disposal because as you add water to the garbage disposal, it pushes the smell up. I actually had to explain that one to my kids the other day. And, um, you know, they said the water stinks, but it's only in the kitchen. Well, a lot of times it's coming from the drain. But when we go to calls like that, they'll actually ask, you know, would you like to be added if we need some? Do they sample from inside the house or from the faucet outside? Usually outside, especially from houses. There are some businesses and even city properties that, um, for example, here they yeah. might sample mm -hmm. from in the bathroom on the tap and let it run for five minutes and then take the sample. Um, so some of them are, out, for the most part, houses, it's an outside spigot. But there are businesses where they will go into the bathroom inside and request permission and take the sample there. Um, and the picture there is actually just an example of our total coliform samples. What we run it for is total coliform and E. coli at the same time. So we collect the samples in those little vials there, and then um, they basically get a indicator packet added to them, and they get placed in an incubator for 24 hours. And then when they come out, ideally, they're going to look like the first third and fourth one where there's nothing has changed. Um, the one on the far right is uh, one of our positive controls we have to run, but that one is one that's actually positive for total coliform. And then the second one, it's actually fluoresces, and that means it's positive for E. coli also, which that was not a distribution <laughs> sample. <laughs> Just want to clarify that. Now, for asbestos testing, it's a nine-year cycle that we're required to do, and that is because we do have some asbestos cement lines or asbestos concrete lines in the system. Um, it's very low, but it's still there, and so we are required to sample for it. Um, and it's really just one sample in the area that, in one area that is, has the concrete pipes there and we collected the sample and sent it out. And um, we collected it February 2020, and it came back not detected. Um, I believe seven is actually the contaminant limit for it, which we were less than 
point two. So, um, and that one will not have to be sampled again until twenty thirty, unless maybe we remove all the asbestos lines by then. Anthony. <laughs> I don't, can, if I can add to that, yeah. there is because you're going to talk about lead and copper too. You know, there Jacksonville is not an old community. You know, nicknamed Boomtown for a reason. You know, it kind of really got started good in the '40s. So there is some advantage to having, you know, I won't say newer infrastructure, but compared to a lot of communities, it's kind of newer infrastructure. So we have, while we have some that's, you know, not great, we have, um, you know, it's smaller portions of our system. So, and when she gets to lead and copper, really, that primarily comes from the homes themselves that had those type of fixtures or the old gooseneck that was constructed during the 80s. And it's really not our system. It's really primarily the the homes themselves. So it's the plumbing in the home. But the city is responsible to, you know, Joe and, and his crew are responsible for the water all the way to the tap. So even though it's not really our system, that's why we're still sampling and testing. Wally, when we finish this, could you give us some sense of what the cost is? Is that like a best is testing expensive other than Amy's expertise, which you have to pay top dollar for, uh, <laughs> the, is the other part of what the testing I, is? And the testing for the other things that you're doing, is there a significant cost? I, I mean, we're doing enough. Some of this we can do in-house, but... We can't do, obviously, we can't do all of this in-house. So they're all costs associated with it. Um, I can't give you what the range is. Um, you know, it's compliance regulatory sampling. So it's not like we can choose not to do it, even if it's expensive. Um, but but the public may you want know, to what know we that could do, safety... What we can do is come back to you and, and tell you kind of what Amy's budget is. I, um, I can't tell you specifically because... Her budget is split. It's actually partially in water treatment because we have a lab at the water treatment plant, and it's partially in wastewater because we have a lab at the wastewater plant. So Amy, it's not like Amy has her own budget where she can say, you know, this is all my budget. Mm -hmm. It's it's really split between the two because those are the areas that she serves. Um, and I'm just thinking the public might want to know that asbestos testing, which everybody's concerned about, you know, has a cost, and they're happy to pay that cost. But, you know, is it something that we can phase out sometime, or are we always having an expensive, or it's an inexpensive thing that we shouldn't even think twice about? I think it's more... Asbestos test was fairly inexpensive, yeah, wasn't it, Amy? I think that one's... I believe it was... I'm not even sure if it was... It less than definitely less than two hundred dollars. Yeah. I'm not sure if it was even close to that. So um, sample every nine years. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, and, and I think the that's public good. would appreciate knowing that it's uh, required. Mm -hmm. You got to do it, but it's not a burden on the mm -hmm. system to pay two hundred dollars every nine years. And I'm going to speak for Anthony here and let him either agree or disagree. But if you were to identify the water pipes in the system that need to be replaced first, I don't think the AC pipes are going to be at the top of his list. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. The wooden ones in downtown. <laughs> we don't have those, but there are communities in North Carolina that do have wooden pipes, wooden and tar or creosote pipes. So, you know, there is... cities in the terracotta. Northeast still have We still have some terracotta. Thought. Do we still have terracotta? We have terracotta. The sewer. Do we have terracotta water? No. I didn't think so. Our, our primary are PVC, which is most recent, and then there's some thin wall PVC. We have um, asbestos <laughs> cement. We have cast iron, galvanized, ductile iron. Ductile iron. I think that's, that's about it. Okay. So we don't have some of the, the others that yeah. other communities have to be concerned with. Back to you, Amy. Okay. 
So we're going to move on to our disinfection byproducts. And the reason this gets sampled is it's areas where it's basically a dead zone in the lines. Um, for example, off of Georgetown where Unwasa and Animal Services is, there's not a lot of pool in the water there. So it's sampled um, to be able to determine that because we are a chlorine-treated water plant system, um, that it's not causing any effect and we still have movement in the system. Um, so we are required to sample for total trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids. Um, they, it's basically a combination of a few different ones that add up together and have to meet a certain level number to fall under, ideally. Um, and what we have been under was we have been sampling four different locations every quarter. So we're talking 16 a year, um, 16 different sites a year that we have been sampling. Before you yeah. go on, um, and to, to add to that, the, the biggest concern in this area is really your water not turning over. So it's the age of your water in the system. So there is a fine balance between having too much storage or not enough use of water in your system and having, you know, not enough storage when you have an event. So there is a fine balance. You know, you don't, you don't want to just go put up a new water tank so you have storage in the event of a hurricane or something like that if you don't have enough demand to turn that tank over. Is it also um, a concern for dead ends? <laughs> and it is a concern mm -hmm. for long dead ends. And we do our, um, we have limits to our dead ends in our uh, manual specification standards and design. Uh, so dead ends can only be a certain length. It a lot coordinate, correlates with dead end roads, um, cul-de-sacs, those kind of things. Um, and where we do have long dead ends, um, I don't remember who at the water plant came up with it. May have been Denise several years ago, but somebody came up with the idea of going to um, automated flushers and they actually attach on a hydrant as close to the dead end as you can get. And it's on a timer and it literally flips on, blows off the water system. So you get, you know, usage or turnover in that area and then it turns off. So, and we, we have those scheduled to go somewhere at, around midnight where usage is lower, something like that. So we have, you know, we're, we're really that way. And it also generates less calls for us. You know, if it's a hydrant blowing off and nobody's around and it's the middle of the day, somebody rides down the street, you know, <laughs> and we get 10 phone calls because of it. So, you know, and it does have a little sticker on it that explains what it's for, but you know, those are, that's some of the ways that we kind of get around this, but you also have to be careful about having too much storage, which, you know, it's kind of one of the problems that the base has faced over the years. They have so much storage in their system that they, you know, they have to balance these numbers very quick and very carefully. What's wrong with stale water? Stale water? Why is it a problem when it's a dead end or something like that? You run the risk of not having chlorine in your water anymore, yep. so you're not disinfected anymore. Because the chlorine dissolves? Oh. Right, over or time. It, it dissipates. It, yeah, it yeah. breaks down. Water that yeah. it'll sit like that will allow things to grow in it that you Well, that's what happen. I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's, the whole thing is. Yeah, after a while, it, it'll yeah. start getting icky. Icky. Yeah. Icky is a good technical term. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Water expert for the county. <clears throat> Several counties. Thank you, Andy. Back to you. Okay. So in order to get to reduced monitoring, um, we have to meet essentially 50% of the maximum contaminant level that the EPA gives us. Um, so for TTHMs, it has to be a level of less than 0 0.04 milligrams per liter. And for the haloacetic acids, it's less than 0 0.03 milligrams per liter. And as you'll see, um, we actually have met that in 2020. 
and we are now on reduced monitoring for 2021. That means that we only have to sample two locations, one time a year, which will fall in um, September, I believe, which means that now we're only sampling for two TTHMs and two HAA5s instead of 16 and 16. So we're looking at a big change in cost, time, everything with that, because <laughs> otherwise we were going quarterly to four different sites and paying to have those all sampled. Um, and I did ask Joe to estimate how much that savings was, and that was about $8,000 a year, give or take. Yay. So. <laughs> so since annual sampling now, if that one annual sample comes out greater than 0 0.04, do you revert back to quarterly? It's kind of a, there is an option there. It goes to increased, which basically means it goes back to routine. Um, so hopefully that doesn't happen and we don't have to address that. Um, but I'm not sure because it runs with the like the lowest running average. Mm -hmm. So it really tallies four quarters into it. Mm -hmm. um, it looks more than just the one number. I'm not sure if it'll encompass right. then four years worth or how that works exactly. So hopefully we don't even have to look at that. But um, Amy, what's the biggest introduction of these two? <laughs> <laughs> what's that? What is the biggest she introduction of TTHMs and uh, AA5s? What, what introduces that into the system, the biggest? I mean, um, when you talk about nitrates, you're talking about usually farm run. It's off. really, it's, it's, you only have to run it on systems that have chlorine added to it for disinfection. Okay. But all systems are required to have some sort of disinfection. Yes, but if you have UV, you're not required to test for it. Which we do not. So this is like a byproduct of the chlorine? Yes. Yeah, essentially. Yes, any of the halogens and chlorine is, so that's the trihalo. If you have three chlorines end up on a compound, it's an issue, so. I love you super intelligent people. We're talking to this dummy over here. Halogen, isn't that a light you put on the front of your truck? Chlorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> Next, we're going to discuss the lead and copper rule, which is what Wally brought up earlier. Um, and <clears throat> it's primarily been houses built in a certain point in the 1980s that were more likely to have um, the specific type of lines in it. And it was focusing on... A, copper and also I believe the lead solder in the lines at the time um, and the we're required to sample every three years for it and it means we basically drop off bottles at 30 houses of people who are generously willing to sample it first thing in the morning and fill it up and then we will go pick it up <laughs> um, and have it run and analyzed and the way it works is it's usually, um, it's based on your 90th percentile. So as long as 90% of the samples are below the MCL, the maximum contaminant level, you pass essentially, but you could have 10% that are still, um, that do you have an actual result in it, but it won't count against us essentially. Um, but in that event, we will actually resample for the people and let them know that they're, you know, what the number is for active water because it's water that's been resting in their pipes overnight. And there has been a few times that we will find out that a number that was high, um, for example, they may have used the bathroom downstairs that they haven't used in four years or things like that that we've heard before. And then when we resample it, a lot of times it is less than, but at that point it doesn't add into this. So it's the first grab sample that adds into this. Um, and coming up in June, 2023 will be the next time we'll have to sample. And at that point, the EPA has been working on updating the lead and copper rule as it exists. And it's going to focus more on um, lead service lines, which we do not have any in our system, um, but we do have some lead goosenecks from what I believe, and we're not sure how that will apply and affect us. 
Um, at this point, it seems like we're not gonna be too affected by that aspect of it. There are some changes to the sampling procedure um, and different things like that that we're gonna have to adhere to, but hopefully we aren't that affected by that one. Um, we're, as part of it, they're in the process of having us go through and evaluate different lines in the system and submit that um, and whatnot, which Anthony and Joe have been working on that a lot for the last couple of months, so. I think also they're gonna add in um, focusing where they're including more schools on the list too. Um, so that way more schools will actually be tested because at this point it wasn't part of the requirement. The requirement was based on the types of service lines in the house. Yeah, I think it's going to try to hit all of the schools. Um, I'm not sure. I want to say it might add some like medical facilities, um, but we'll learn more about it as they put it out. They're still just talking about it at this point. Does your sampling include any schools now for any of the sampling, not just the lead and copper, but the others? Our distribution bacteria, um, some of those are schools added on the list. And then the dead ends are not, I'm trying to think of what other ones. I think it's pretty much the distribution ones. Distributions are a lot of the dead ends, but we, because we decided that would be the best for the public, because of, if we had it anywhere, it would be there. So the total coliform sampling is the one that primarily hits, um, we sample at schools. It's schools, businesses, um, some people's houses, some parks even, um, the bathroom supplies there get hit. Do you do asbestos or lead and copper at the school? No, not at this point. Okay. Um, asbestos was taken from an area of, I believe it was within Bryn Mawr, um, and that was collected in an area where we're known to have asbestos piping. Uh, prior to that, it was collected from, I believe it was a Bojangles um, down in Bryn Mawr area, but it's not that any longer, so I'm not sure Smith what it is. It was the Smith Fields, thank you. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, it doesn't exist now, it's <laughs> right. something else, but. Um. Open, I don't think it was our decision when we took the lead copper. I think the state took our lead, didn't it? We, we took the lead and copper? It was based on the housing plans. Yeah, yeah. It was based on the age of the housing, and if you had the potential of lead, solder and when the lead and copper program started in 1992 it was based on houses that were less than 10 years old that might have had lead solder because if they were older than 10 years old the lead solder was not going to give off any Absolutely. lead anymore the the copper pipes it is, is the solder connections mm -hmm. and the yeah. is what the real problem is which is just houses built during a certain time period that's the way it was that's what meets started. the like it's a set of like different levels for primary criteria. So if you have 30 houses that meet the highest criteria, like what we discussed, then you pick those 30 houses. If you have only 25, your five is gonna come from a tier lower, which means the next things on the list essentially. Multi-unit housing or something like that, but we'd, we've never had to do that. We have more than 30 houses that. Gotcha. Right. Um, so it wasn't yeah. up to us whether we put schools on that list or things like that. That was um, all dictated by the basically the, when things were built. Um, so in the future, as it changes, we're going to see more schools added to it. And that's the EPA that's changing that. How about nursing homes? Are they on it? I believe it may be added to it because I know it's supposed to add some medical facilities. Um, and I would imagine nursing homes would fit the bill too and maybe other um, like more public or community housing. Um, it reads that way when it comes down to when it actually comes out. We're not sure what will meet the highest level of criteria, I guess. They might also fall into levels. I think they should. My mother lived in one for 10 years and they were not the cleanest places, so... That's the only reason I'm saying that. Yeah, I understand that. And I mean, a big concern, you know, for the schools being added to it is because there's been so many, you know, different things in the news with the school systems and whatnot. And I mean, especially 
now where after COVID and hurricanes, kids haven't been in school <laughs> all year. <laughs> so, you know, it's definitely a great thing that they're adding to it. And, and we will definitely even add to the list because they do ask, you know, what people think should be added. And we can recommend that they add <laughs> more nursing homes and medical facilities well, we, too. I that. asked about the schools and I want to applaud your staff for doing what they are doing with the schools, even though it's not required, because I think a lot of people are concerned about their kids and what they, you know, are exposed to. So uh, the explanation that in some cases it's not necessary because the schools don't have anything that's that old or, you know, and I'd never heard say, hey, we're not doing it because we're not you know, not told to, you're not doing it for a valid reason. So I applaud again the concern for the schools and maybe we can get nursing homes elevated to the same level in the future, but thank your staff for that concern. Thank you. I'm not saying, did I die? <laughs> Wait, okay. Yeah. It's just slow to wake up, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Aren't we all? So everything that we've discussed here, um, for the most part, you will find in the 2020 Consumer Competence Report that, as we discussed earlier, was a link was given in the bill insert that should have been received by everyone. Um, and then besides that, you can also go to the city website and find the water quality report for 2020. Um, it has been required by the EPA uh, since 1999, and within it includes contact info for um, the water plant and I believe our chief operator, Joseph Cram. Um, <laughs> and it also gives discussion on different chemicals and whatnot and what it means to our consumers, basically. So it includes some discussions about um, about the lead and copper rule, for example, and why some things like nitrates might be important and why you might be concerned with them. So if someone wants to learn more about that, you could definitely read the Consumer Confidence Report and answer some of those questions. And I guess that's it, I believe, on that one. I don't know if there's any. All again. right, I'm up again. I don't know if there was more questions, but all right. And now for our blue frog update at the wastewater plant. Um, so at this point, I believe our first set of blue frogs was added to the center cell um, back in June of 2016. So we're approaching five years in the center cell. Um, and what we're gonna discuss is some of the effluent results that go out and are irrigated onto the trees at the land treatment plant. And then um, some of the sludge levels that we see now in the area lagoons compared to back in 2016. Could I ask you to simply explain what the blue frog is for people that don't know? The blue frog is actually an aeration system of a specific brand of aerators that are essentially developed to function as an aerator, but re reduce or remove built up sludge from a pond. Um, so we were kind of, we were under a pilot study initially for them. And if you see in the image there, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, regular aerators are in those little square cells and then as you go into the longer cells, there's a patch of five you can see kind of um, there and there are five blue frog aerators and there's also nine towards the front. And it's um, absolute aeration, I believe, is the um, maker of them. And um, it's supposed to work by being able to reverse the cycle of how it's rotating within the actual aeration lagoon and in turn it should um, eat the sludge. It's also uh, supposed to use a lot less energy than the conventional aerators, correct? Um, it's supposed to use less energy. Um, I, I'm not sure how much 
less it is on a actual again so our the the three rectangular cells that are up there I, I think it looks like a domino personally <laughs> with a little small five in there but um, there's actually nine across the front and then five kind of centered uh, in each of the the rectangular cells um, originally in those we had six 10 horsepower aerators are those the same size as the ones that are in the uh, square those cell? are actually 50s Okay. So 50 horsepower in the first in the in the squares, okay. and while one's feet? not running because it was probably down when this aerial was taken, there's actually four in each of the the first f three uh, square cells, and then there are a total of nine and five is 14, right? So 14 mm -hmm. in the rectangular cells, um, and I don't know if I'm able to draw maybe. Kim or Alan can make it so I can draw it the better because I think it'll help. Well, the question was asked is the 50 per uh, aerator or was yes. this? So yeah. the, it's 50. So up front, hopefully, this is going to work. Yes. So each one of these are 50 horsepower. And so this is active aeration. The idea is they're in, you know, waste work comes in and Jill's, I'm. I'll let Jill correct me if I'm wrong, or, or Amy. But as the wastewater comes in, it's kind of stagnant. So we're adding oxygen back in here. And so we're doing it with high horsepower, low area, low volume, lower volume. And then in this area, we actually had six. So there was one here, 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 and here. So there was a total of 60 horsepower. And I don't remember how much... Um, horsepower each of these are, but I want to say that the total for the 14 is like 43 horsepower. Each of those are three. So it's horsepower. 14 and three. 42 horsepower Four, in, each, so, in each train. I wish it would have been uh, So each train before. has 42 horsepower in it now. So that's where the savings come soon. Uh, what I will say is they are easier to maintain. They are easier to get clogs out. Um, we can actually run them in reverse. So as, as you know, algae or other things get into them, um, you know, sometimes rags or something like that get in there. Um, we can actually, they can actually run those in reverse and they don't have to go out to it and unclog it from a little John boat or something like that. So they are a little bit easier to maintain also. Um, but when it comes down to energy savings, I don't know that we've seen a ton of energy savings, although it is less horsepower, so it does draw less energy. It also has less impact when one out of 14 goes kaput on you than one out of six goes on kaput on right. you. Well, and admittedly, we didn't always run all six. Okay. So it was, is it in the winter we would shut yeah. two to three down no, because it was that we didn't have to have as much oxygen added back in. Um, so there are times where we didn't run all six. So, uh, you know, it's hard to say about the energy component. Um, but, you know, if you just do a, a straight line comparison, they are more energy efficient because they're less horsepower. And they've had a bigger impact on the accumulated sludge. Well, we'll I'll let Amy get to that in a minute. Um, one of the things I do want to say is... The reason these are concentrated, so you've kind of got a nine here right at the front, and then you've got five here. The way this works, does it come in from the left of this one? Is it the left corner, front left corner? Yeah, and then it... So the pipe it'll feed feeds into the through group. here and feeds the wastewater into this lagoon, and then it, we have curtains that kind of force it yeah, you can kind of almost see the opening right above where I stopped. And then the wastewater, oops, the wastewater moves through like this. So in the plan, and then it, it moves into the back cell like this. In the plan, this, the front area that I boxed where the, the nine are was kind of more of the active variation. And then the second was kind of passive. And then they called the back part the quiescent zone, if I said that mm -hmm. correctly. Um, so as Amy talks about the sludge removal, um, 
or, or what we've seen over time with sludge, you'll have to realize that it's, you know, before the sludge was kind of um, spread throughout the lagoon more evenly. And now what we find is because of this technique, you have some zones or some areas that have more sludge and some areas that have less. So she's taken an average of all of it. So with that, I'll let her, I'll turn it back over to her. Okay. First, we're gonna talk about um, the effluent sampling, which this is what we discharge onto the trees out there at the land treatment site. Um, and what we have seen, and this is going back to 2016, um, up until last month, most recently is what's been added in. And um, it's basically taking a trend line average for each of these, uh, just to get an idea. And what we've noticed is our pH has increased um, from 7.4 to about 2 point, or 7.6. Um, and that increase is actually a good thing because if ever, some of you will remember um, the discussion about the trees and whatnot at the land treatment site where actually a higher pH is preferred by the loblolly pines. So that's actually a really good thing that's increasing. Um, our BODs, which is our biochemical oxygen demand, um, is decreased by um, 32 to 14 milligrams per liter. And the BOD, um, it's actually how much oxygen can be consumed from the, or depleted from the effluent sample itself. Um, for TSS, which is our total suspended solids, um, we are seeing a reduction of solids from 30 to about 17 milligrams per liter. Um, in ammonia, we are seeing a reduction, or actually an increase, from 6 milligrams per liter to 16 milligrams per liter. And um, one thing that we've discussed with uh, blue frog aeration is that they believe it's possible that from all the built up sludge that had been accumulating, that as we actually are reducing that with the blue frog aerators, that it will actually release some ammonia into it. So that may be why we're seeing that increase go through and make its way eventually through the next stages of lagoons out into the field where we discharge it. Um, and then on, for phosphorus, we are actually seeing a small decrease, uh, 3.6 milligrams per liter to 2.8 milligrams per liter. And before you leave that slide, yeah. one of the changes that we've seen um, since we started this project, and Jill will have to help me remember timelines here, but we were taking um, leachate from the county landfill at LTS, and then for a period of time we stopped because they diverted it to Omwasa's um, northeast, uh, northeast treatment plant. And what ended up happening is um, it was so concentrated that it actually did quite a bit of damage to Omwasa's treatment plant. So through an agreement, they turned it back to us. Um, so in this, we are back to, even though our most of our, other than ammonia, I would say everything else is better or slightly better um, for our situation. You know, that includes the addition of the leachate back into our system, into our treatment system. So that's relatively good news. And here's where we're going to talk about the sludge levels. So here we have it marked where train one, train two, and train three. Train two is actually where we first installed the blue frogs in June of 2016. And after that project was going fairly well, um, in February 2018, we added the blue frog aerators to train one and train three. So what we've seen overall, and keep in mind the way Wally had um, mapped out the, that longer rectangular section of the train, it's essentially one, two, and three cells in each of the trains. 
Um, we have taken a level each time in the first cell, the second cell, and the third cell of each train. The third cell being that quiescent um, cell that was talked about before. And so what these numbers represent is an actual average change for each of the trains themselves. So we've averaged together what has changed in cell one, two, and three in those trains. Um, and what you'll find is that in train one, overall, um, you'll see we've had an average decrease in about 12.7 um, inches. So about a foot, we've seen a decrease in sludge and actually in train one. In train two, um, we've seen a decrease of 4.7 inches. And while train two has had um, sludge in it, or had the blue frog areas in it for the longest time, um, I'm, I believe blue frog aeration had said at some point that, you know, we might be, I think it's the sludge is changing within it where it's the old sludge versus new sludge and might change some of the depths of it. So while, so train one who's had them for less time is still um, losing at a faster rate, I guess. Um, train three, there's a very small decrease average across the board for it. And it really, two of the cells within there actually had a decrease and one of them had a fairly significant increase of about two feet. So it averaged out to about less than one for a change, which train three was the one that had not had sludge removed before. So train three kind of had an extra buildup of sludge and whatnot. So it's still kind of in the process of seeing, I think, what it will do. Where's that higher amount of sludge in the first, second, or third section? Um, it was in the first section, I believe. Where the nine are. Yeah. That's where the, uh, the, the increase has been. Yeah. So uh, is it fluffier? It's it's darker. <laughs> As we're getting into these technical uh, I don't know about of, fluffy. fluffy. Yeah. Um, I would say it's darker and maybe kind of more dense. You Like you hit the dense faster in that one than you do in the other ones if you were to to drop something in to pull a sample up or the sludge does, you'll see that, you know, the darker layer goes higher. Um, I don't know that I'd say it's fluffy or anything like that. I, I, I think the question is, is in that, for, in that train, in the first section, is that new or is that old that has been? I think we have a lot of old built up sludge that's still trying to work on, okay. honestly. The oldest sludge and the deepest sludge. Yeah. I don't think that one's ever been dredged, had it? No. No, because it was new at 2009, I believe. Well, in 2009, when we completed the upgrade of the plant from 6 million to 9 million, that tra train three in its entirety was first put into service. And seeing as it's gone 12 years without having to have sludge removed when normally before the blue frogs, we were having to dredge all of the lagoons every three to five years, it's not too bad. Yeah. The dredging cost is expensive. Yes. Very So you're not saying that the blue frogs are adding to this at a, a rate that made the two feet appear. It's yeah, I don't. It's not necessarily the blue frogs have added to it. Um, the blue frogs have a process to it where I think it's. I think it might be even up to four years. It will keep eating through old sludge essentially, and there's kind of a cycle to it that the more old sludge you have, the longer it will take, obviously, to work through that. So at this point, I think it's still, we're still kind of seeing all that it can do. We're, I don't think we're close to seeing changes in train three, I think. I think there's still more to come, but it'll just be a slower road. But it does look better in the sec second section and third section of train three. It, it does, it looks better. Um, I think the image there, that's from, 
you know, Google, and I think it, you could kind of see where it looks like in train three, the last cell is actually a little bit lighter, but that could also be, you know, reflection and location of satellite and whatnot too. Mm. So, but I mean, it does seem like it's definitely changing things in there. To add to that, part of the challenge we have with measuring the sludge is there's really two different methods. And the company prefers a weighted disc, which I don't know how else to describe it, but to me it looks like half of a plow that they kind of drop down on a rod. Mm -hmm. And where it hits resistance, then you measure the free water above it. And then the other is what Amy mentioned is a sludge judge, which imagine a you know, a hollow glass tube that you put down into the sludge and then you close the bottom and you pull it up and you have, you know, a cross section of water, theoretically. Um, but, you know, I've seen part of it, you know, if you use the sludge judge, you would think that would be kind of an accurate method. However, if you push it in fast, you kind of push all of the, the, what sludge is suspended up into the column or if you don't get it closed right or, or, you know. So the key there is having the same person do it over and over. And then the weighted disc method, we're actually measuring free water above it. So if the water level in the lagoon changes slightly, yeah. then it can mess with your numbers also. Um, when we first started the pilot program, we hired Parker and, Parker and Associates to actually go out in GPS specific locations and then use a sludge judge, um, and, you know, we put some parameters of, around how they use it, um, and measure the sludge that was existing. And then once we got toward the end of the year program, and I can't remember numbers, we had Parker and Associates go back out there at the same surveyed point, so you're measuring the same, you know, you can't measure the whole lagoon, but measure the same specific points that they surveyed and it was the same guy using it so theoretically we're keeping it as consistent as possible and um what we found was that if i remember correctly because greg did all of those analyses before he left um, but if i remember correctly that compared to the weighted disc method actually showed more reduction than using the weighted disc because um, and I think um, we felt like we being William and Jill and Amy and I, as we were talking and discussing this, is the weighted disc can be a little bit deceiving because of depending on how much, you know, free water you have moving through lagoon. So you could have a heavy rain period or anything like that where you have elevated water levels. And guess what? You have more free water, so you have less sludge, right? So there was, you know, we did try, you know, Part of this is trying to be consistent so we don't do it right after, we don't measure right after a rain, rain event or anything like that. Um, but what we can say is from our numbers, nothing is increasing and nothing has increased from 2016. So while it may not be, you know, while it may not look like we've reduced sludge, you know, two feet or something crazy like that, we're still not adding to it and we're still pushing off, you know, within that time, we should theoretically be mechanically dredging. So there is a savings there because we're, even if we're not quickly dissolving the sludge that's there, we are prolonging the time at which we have to mechanically dredge. Um, Amy, I remember, I recall that, um, Blue Frog came with like a guarantee where they were going to, they, they were assuring us of a, a standard or a measurement that they did, done, did not achieve. And we actually decided, um, what, forgave, we, 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 we were, did yeah. not hold them to the guarantee because I guess it was a it was, money back. It were, they were going to stop completely. I forgot the exact details. They would details. take them back. They would take them back and we would be out like, 20% or 25% uh, or right, something. Right, right, right. But, I mean, I understand keeping them because it was it was not the progress they promised, but it was progress. That's right. And it seemed, if I recall correctly, there was some aspect of our system that wasn't really the same as the other systems they used in the past. Can you 
you think about that? Or um, does that make sense? The yeah, the only thing I could think of is how long the detention time is for it to get through the aerated train, essentially. So I think the systems that they had shown us, examples of were all, um, it would take like 30 days for it to go from the beginning cell all the way through to the end. And I believe our system's more five days. So oh, that awesome. may also be some of the reason why we haven't seen the results as fast as they said. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's still obviously a good thing. I mean, it's like I said, well, I remember at the time t talking about the cost of that dredging and, and getting rid of that sludge and all, too. Yes. Just trucking it away. Yeah. It was, was several hundred thousand dollars every four to five years. Right. Right. Yep. It was a it was a substantial savings with every year you don't have to do it. And at the time we started with the blue frogs and put them in, the original aerators were almost 20 years old at that yep. point, so they were at the end of their life cycle anyway, so we were going to have to put in some sort of aerators, rather conventional or blue frog. The equipment was breaking down at that point. The one, and they're not mentioned up here, but when we added the, after we did the first and decided to keep and proceed with the trains one and three, um, we also added two or three gold frogs to our West Lagoon, which is the lagoon that pumps out. And the idea behind that um, was that it would create, for lack of a better term, a, a soap that would help coat the lines and coat the nozzles. We have not seen the benefit from that. You know, it just, and Williams, you know, when William and I talk about it, you know, his comment is, you know, as the pumps are running and those are, it's probably creating some of that. But then what happens is you draw it all out at once because, yeah. you know, you're sending so much water out at one time that you're, you're really just flushing it right through the system. So you really don't see any added benefit like we were hoping to. Part, part of this is our system is not like Blue Frog's other systems. Like That's correct. One, is it Wilmington that we went to see? No, we, we went Jill went with, yeah, we went all the way to Georgia yeah. and saw three yeah. different systems. Yeah. And so, I mean, they're, they're experimenting because ours is a larger. And That's right. Than what they're used to. But they have moved on to other um Based on ours and our findings, they have moved on to other systems closer to ours also. So, and again, it's, you know, if you look at the fact that we've been able to get away as long as we have without mm -hmm. mechanically dredging, which, you know, inevitably we will have to do at some point. But the further we can push that out, the... You know, the more, again, it's it's better for our ratepayers. We reduce that cost. How, how long is a train out of service when you dredge? Because you have to drain it to dredge it. Jill was actually out there the last time we did one, and I was, um, it was before Wally. So um, <laughs> At I'll least let her a answer. week to two weeks, because what you have to do is if you, you have to chain, open the valve to drain it naturally into the, other two trains as much as you can and then pump the rest of the water out so that what you're left is the dark super name because you're paying for every gallon that you land apply yeah. so you want to make sure that you are not land applying effluent onto sludge land and they um it takes a good bit because you have to make sure that the baffles that separate the trains are taken down properly you have to make sure it it, like everything else we do, is weather dependent because if it's raining, the contracted operation, they can't take out the sludge. So, and we can, our flow is such that we can operate on two trains, no problem, because we're not at capacity, but it still, it affects the whole operation. Well, that's what I was going to ask you is, mm -hmm. if you take one train out to do it, then it has an effect on the operation, but not to the point where you're losing it capacity to no because we have a <coughs> million gallon plant and our average is way less than six million gallons a day at this point still isn't it amy yeah five, that, four five five that's the average yeah, yeah except for those rainy months yeah so you know it's not a burden and the other is they actually put equipment in there 
So now you have to you have concern with your liner too. Yeah. That's all I have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Well, good evening. Uh, tonight we're going to discuss uh, sewer main inspection, uh, the importance of sewer main inspection, the frequency of the inspections, and some of the resources that we need and utilize for these inspections to go properly. So why do we do these sewer main inspections? Well, it's in our collection system permit. Uh, our permit's issued by NCDEQ. It specifies... Excuse me, Anthony, we have people that aren't familiar with such terms. Is that North Carolina Department of... Environmental Quality. Thank you. It specifies, docu it has documentation and reporting requirements in the permit requires monitoring of high priority lines every six months, maintenance of, maintenance of all collection system right of ways, and requires 10% of our collection system to be cleaned every year. That's all in our permit. So what are high priority lines? There are aerial lines, lines crossing waterways, lines contacting surface waters, lines positioned parallel to stream banks, and lines with habitual blockages and known problem areas. Now, the last one uh, is a city policy. Uh, we go the extra measure to ensure that any trouble areas we have, we inspect those pretty frequently. Um, and it keeps us in compliance with our permit because it helps us prevent sewer spills. And Jill actually sees us once a week because an area down Luckily, from her I'm is one of those. I'm the house that's not needing it, but my next door neighbors, my three next door neighbors, all their systems sit low or something. They're flat, mm -hmm. and um, uh, they are actually houses too. We're uh, one of few houses in the city that have basements. And luckily, we do not have a bathroom in our basement, but some of those houses at some time in the past, they had put bathrooms in the basement. And so when that sewer backed up, it backed up into the Yeah, You, you are very fortunate. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I'm so happy I'm not on that line. But yeah, so we see you guys out there. You're on a, it's on a normal, uh, regular rotation that they're out there taking saying care Jill of it. Jill is a known problem area. <laughs> <laughs> known from Jill. <laughs> it's like the next door. It's like the three neighbors next to me all have to deal with yeah. it. Yeah. And we've actually had to come in your neighborhood and put uh, back <coughs> backwater valves on some of the sewer lines there so it can prevent what uh, Mr. Jill was just talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it, and they're older homes. They're from the late 50s. So high priority lines here on the right, you see a picture of a high priority line. It's a gravity sewer line that's crossing a ditch. Um, we try to inspect our high priority lines every Friday. Some require weekly cleaning. These are the ones that are our trouble areas. Um, so every Friday, we have a minimum of two personnel in a jet vacuum truck checking these trouble areas. Uh, and it's a very slow process, especially um, depending on how bad the line is. It doesn't need to be vacuumed and as well as jetted. It, it can be a very slow process. Anthony, is it a yeah. problem because of it doesn't gravity flow fast enough or a problem because of what people put into it? It's a combination. It's a combination of the two. Here's another high priority line. This is over there. It's crossing the East Thompson School Creek over there at Wardola. This is actually a force main that was recently installed. I don't know who did that project while it was done not too long ago. Yes, they did a good job um, too. Um, but um, I can come up with it in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. This is a, like I said, sewer force main that we, we keep inspected. This is a gravity sewer line. This is actually an older gravity sewer line, as you can tell. Um, that we inspect, and that is on the opposite side of the East Thompson School Creek at Wardola. And behind it, there's actually another sewer line. If you look closely, there's actually two sewer lines there. That's down by Sturgeon City, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That one? Mm -hmm. Okay. The right side is actually Sturgeon City Park. Mm -hmm. Cleaning and inspection. So the city of Jacksonville approximately has 
300 miles of, of sewer main. And our target is to clean 10% of that per year, so 30 miles. In 2020, staff cleaned 32 miles of sewer main. That doesn't seem like a lot, um, but you have to take into account this is not just a, sending a jetter hose down a sewer main and pulling it back. It's a, it's a slow process. Sometimes we have to clean the line three or four times. Um, like I said, very slow process. 32 miles, I think, was equivalent to 468 football fields. I think it was like 168,000 linear feet sewer line, if I'm not mistaken. Don't check my math on that. <laughs> um, so staff worked hard on that last year. Like I just said, you know, multiple passes with the sewer jet truck. Um, you know, the jet trucks hold water. I think one of them holds 1,500 gallons of water and the other one holds 1,000. So you can imagine when you're jetting, you're going through that water pretty quickly. Staff has to stop, refill the water, go back to where they were, continue the jet. Um, I think our jet trucks are rated 80 gallons per minute, um, 80 gallons per minute at 2,000 PSI. Um, and then a debris tank for each jet truck, one's 1,500 gallons and one is 1,000 gallons. So again, when your debris, your debris tank gets full, if you're jetting the line that has a lot of debris, you have to leave and do the debris tank. So again, time-consuming process. After that, we feed a video camera into the manhole and we take a video survey of the sewer lines. And that's how we kind of come up with some of our capital projects, seeing defects in all the, the sewer mains. Um, and then we also, like I said, find issues and we might add some of these areas to our high priority line inspections. Are all sewer lines the same diameter? No, sir, they're not. Um, the minimum in Jacksonville, main wise, I believe is eight inch. And it goes all the way up. I've seen here. I know we have some 54 on some of our trunks. So that would probably be the, the largest. Yeah. Um, I would think that out of 300 miles, doing 32 miles is like doing a third when you consider that it could have been a 54 inch or it could all have been mm -hmm. eight inch. So, and it, a 54 inch is a little bit more challenging than an eight inch. Uh, the, oh yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely correct. Okay. Out where some of these are located, mm -hmm. as you're going to see in a minute. Here is an example of jetting of a sewer line, um, and to the right is you can't really see it real well, but it's a it, that's what we do. It's a survey paperwork after we jet a sewer line. We'll do the survey, and we have physical paper about you know it'll show where every defect was on the line, um, <coughs> things of that nature in the survey. And before you leave that, can you go back? Um, while this group is really focused on water and sewer, um, I think everybody's aware that council has a big initiative to try to pave as many streets as we can and, and stretch our power bill dollars as far as they can. Part of the challenge is many of our streets have water and sewer infrastructure under them. And in some cases, some of the... Uh, potholes or, or um, divots. I actually, as we were sitting here, had a citizen text me three potholes or actually sinkholes that they found where the, the asphalt's collapsing um, underneath, you know, starting to, you know, erode from sewer related issues. So we have to, this is the process when we identify a street, it's not that we just pick a street and say, yep, that's what the one we're going to do. We sit down and we pick streets based on volume, you know, uh, the grade of the street, but a big one is utilities. And for every street we pick or every street segment that we pick, Anthony's crews have to go add that to their list so that we can end up, and we, we actually have an engineer or an engineer tech on staff that goes through every one of these for every segment of street that we do and evaluates, you know, can we, you know, if we make two or three repairs, can we, you know, 
resurface this whole street or can we resurface this street without making any repairs? And, you know, some of the challenges that we run into, I think Doris is a great example of, unfortunately, we repaved Doris, you know, the infrastructure was in good shape when we repaved, but whether it was through the construction process or something else, we started having water leaks pop up along Doris after we had repaved. Within, you know, I think the first one was in uh, the first year, maybe. Um, so unfortunately, there's some that we just can't see and we won't know about. But, you know, when, when we say, I think we take for granted a, long, a lot when we say we evaluate the utilities underneath, this is the process we go through when we evaluate sewer lines to see if we can repave a street without having to do major infrastructure work before we do it. Well, over here on Bayshore that's so bad, you're going to have to fix those lines before you repave it or it's just going to sink again. And our, and our only option there is probably dig and replace yeah. a lot of that. Yeah. You know, if you have some that um, have some offset joints or, you know, some minor cracking or something like that, a lot of times we've talked about our inflow and infiltration project where we do a cured in place lining where we feed for lack of a better term a sock through the pipe and then we cure it and it's a pipe inside of a pipe that is a system that we use a lot where we can unfortunately and a great example we are going to start monday i believe with a um, fairly large sewer repair along sioux drive and seminole trail um, such to the point if you're driving in that area going near the middle school there could be some short detours um, but you know we we had that street identified and it was in the the infrastructure was in pretty good shape all but you know kind of a small area and you know that small area is preventing us from repaving those portions of the street so we're having to do a a project and and then as we started examining it we realized that it was even worse than we thought it was um, and to the point where manholes were sinking, they didn't have a bottom in them. So um, those are, you know, as we're doing our street projects, this is the same process that we have to go for evaluating our sewer lines. Sorry, Anthony. Yeah, you're good. And here is a piece of equipment that we use for our evaluations. This is our sewer camera van. Has a camera in the back of the van. Uh, you drop the camera down into the manhole and the operator operates the camera in the middle of the van. He has a TV screen there with remote controls. Imagine playing a video game mm -hmm. in your living room with your grandkid or, or kids. It's kind of the same setup here. Except for all you see is a pipe and some water and some nasty stuff. No little Mario's coming up. <laughs> no, 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 none of those. It's definitely not the little green pipe that Mario <laughs> drops down into, that's for sure. <laughs> and here, it may be a little hard to see, but there's little green, light green squares. These are the high priority line inspections that we performed in 2020. And like I had stated earlier, you know, in our permit, we are required to maintain our sewer easements and right-of-ways. This is a piece of equipment that helps us do that. We try to do as much internally as possible. Here's another piece of right-of-way equipment that we use. And you can see the before and after, after we, uh, we mow down our right-of-ways. If we can go back to that one. We mentioned some of them are hard to get to. This is a great <laughs> example of how can you inspect something that you can't even get to. So um, part of it is, you know, even if it's maintained and cut, you saw it was with a tracked fecon head or a tracked piece of equipment with a fecon head on it, you know, you, you're not just, even if you, if you get it cut nice and you've maintained that, you're still not going to just run, 
your camera van down that, you know, stretch of woods and, or your jet truck and be able to access that. So it's still a challenge um, for some of those that are running through the, through the woods or which many of our major outfill falls run along streams and um, through less developed areas because it's lower and we're using gravity to move the sewer along. Do you have any encroachment issues with fences and stuff? All the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I haven't personally experienced any yet. I could show you, um, <laughs> I could show you, and I don't know how it happened, but I can show you two houses that are literally built over top of a sewer line. Really? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So people need to watch uh, their plats and where it says uh, yeah. utility right of way and not put their fence over it. I honestly don't know how that happened. Oh, well, that's I, the whole know, it's, house it, things, but. It predates yeah. us but it's happened. And here is um, the sewer jet truck that we use. This is what helps us get our 10% cleaning per year. How long are the lines in that that you can actually go down the pipe? We usually have a line about 600 feet. Um, and, and again, talking about you know, time, a time-consuming process, you usually go about 400 foot and you're out of water. So you have to go back and refill water. When you said you have two work, uh, employees that are doing this, is this all they do? Monday through Thursday, we are working on our 10% cleaning. It takes all year. Four employees, two of these trucks running Monday through Thursday. And that's if you don't have an emergency that requires that's a That's correct, which they arise Arcane all the time. or anything else that will stop it, yeah. Okay. Now, this Speaking is an interesting photo. <laughs> Speaking of emergencies. Yeah, this was an emergency. Um, it was actually in front of the city manager's house. Um, <laughs> You see the boom coming off the top of the truck. That is the vacuum system. Everything that gets sucked up in that boom goes to the debris tank. Uh, you can see our employees are working hard. You got one over there pushing the grass with, with a broom, trying to get as much wastewater off the ground as we possibly could. Um, you got one employee down in a vault where the sewer repair failed, not sewer repair, a sewer air relief valve had malfunctioned. Um, and he was down there making that repair to that sewer air relief valve. So is this it, was a reportable spill. Uh, you probably remember this is one that we brought to you two years ago. This one, yeah, but this was not one of the larger ones. So, um, I think we were able to get a lot of this up. I think we reported 375 gallons that was reportable that spilled. So our staff, we really did clean up a lot. Here we go again, you got the boom. Um, I cannot tell if they're fixing to vacuum out a manhole or not, but that's usually uh, how we do that. I can't see with that shadow. And as you can see, this is a map for 2020 of our cleaning and video inspections. Um, I mean, you can't even see Northwoods on there. It, it's covered. So, uh, again, we're very busy in, in this part of our operation. And like we've said, Anthony showed you that cut sheet, you know, for each one of these that we've videoed, we've got a cut sheet to go with that segment of line for those. And um, to add to that, the videos, they don't just go away. You know, we have a, a bank. We can go back and look at any video that we want to look at. That's a lot of video. That's all I have for tonight. <laughs> so now we are in open discussion period. If anybody has anything they'd like to bring up or discuss or questions, thank you all, everybody. Not trying to prolong this evening. I'm sure you're tired of looking at us, but um, in light of the recent um, attack on the gas line, Mr. Nickel 
mentioned that I might want to talk about our water treatment plant and our water treatment system. So, you know, I, I won't go into full detail, but what I will say is that um, should something like that happen, because there's always, you know, we do have um, control of our plant and, you know, we operate our remote, our wells remotely. So there, you know, there is some susceptibility. What I will say is we have a great IT department that makes sure that we are, you know, as secure as we can be, but, you know, the, you know what the most vulnerable piece of any system is, right? It's the user. The user clicks on something they really shouldn't have, and that's how they get in. Um, but what I will say is, um, should that happen, we can actually take our plant completely offline, and we can operate it manually. We can operate all of our wells manually, um, and actually, you know, it was probably a blessing in disguise at the time, but when we originally um, constructed the wells and the water treatment plant, the piece that held us up the longest was actually the SCADA system to control the plant. And Joe's people learned how to operate the plant manually, and I think they ran the plant manually the first six months or something. So... Um, not saying we're not susceptible, but what I can tell you is that even if that did happen, we can take everything, put it in manual, and um, we can operate it. We just have to bring some staff on, you know, over, you know, our, we're, we operate 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, 366 last year. Um, so, you know, we continually operate. But because of the control we have in our system, you know, we're able to do that with practically two people on duty, um, and in some cases, even just one person on duty, depending on what we're operating. Um, so we, we've tried to get our staffing down as, as much as we can, um, and we do that because of, you know, our ability to control things remotely and digitally. Um, but it does create... Um, you know, vulnerabilities in our system, but our system is pretty secure. And if, if we were to have an attack, we do have the ability to cut ourselves off and, and really operate the plant manually. Um, and then our wastewater plant really is primarily operated manually anyway. Um, all the valves in the field that they use to control the zones are um, turned by hand, and while that doesn't sound like a big deal, I've mentioned before, you know, we have some 36-inch valves, so you're talking three times the diameter of the pipe for the number of turns plus one or something like that. So, you know, it's a lot of turns, to, to, and they do it every day, so, you know, in multiple areas. Um, so... The, and then our pumps, they control them from the building, but we can also control those manually. And then our wastewater lift stations, we have monitoring all, at all of our uh, wastewater lift stations, but we have no control remotely. So it's not like somebody could, you know, hack into the main pump station and turn pumps off or anything like that. You have to physically be at the station to do anything. Um, you know, and those are controlled by float systems that tell the pumps when to turn on, turn off, add a pump, you know, turn a pump, you know, ramp a pump down. You know, it may not turn all the way off. It may just slow down based on the flow. Um, but all of those are locally at the station. They're not remotely, while they're remotely monitored, they're not remotely controlled. So, um, you know, I, I want the... Residents of Jacksonville, Jacksonville to feel pretty comfortable that um, we're in good shape. You'll get your water and have your sewage removed mm -hmm. no matter what happens. That's right. Anything else? Well, that, I'd like to say I think your presentation tonight was very well presented from all your staff and very useful and helpful. Very good presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if we have no other business, if our next regular meeting is Thursday, June 10th at 5.30. And if we would like to entertain a motion to adjourn, 
I'll make a motion that we adjourn tonight's meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All Thank opposed? You. Meeting adjourned.